these last speakers are emphasizing a point that really is substantially important for the overall picture of this battle. New Orleans and the area around it was a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multilingual reality in the early 19th century. And that reality was transmitted to the field of battle through free men of color and other free persons of color. And their story is something that is not simply an antecedent to the narrative, but something that should be situated directly in the middle of the narrative. And this is why it was recognized as being important to represent this as a part of this symposium. And now on to our keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Gene Smith is an instructor at Texas Christian University, but then an interesting fact that you won't find on the printed bio is that he used to be a secret agent. <laughs> a secret agent that had garbage cans thrown at him. Um, but that is for another story. Nevertheless, he is now ready to present, as you've seen the slide, the slaves gamble for freedom, continuing this theme of the multi-ethnic and reality of this city in the early 19th century. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gene Allen Smith. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me out there? Yes? Okay, you know, I want to start by thanking Curtis and the, uh, the organizers of this event for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Um, and as a scholar and historian and a person who writes book, I'm often asked questions and there's two questions I want to address today at the very beginning of this talk so you can kind of get an understanding of where I'm coming from. It's a question of, you know, why did you write this book and when did you start writing this book? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you an antidote here, a vignette, so to speak, and it, it addresses both of those and I think it's very poignant because I know exactly when I began this book. I began this book in the fall of 1997. And it was early October. It was between 10 and 11. Uh, I was teaching a U.S. history survey class, and we were talking about the Battle of New Orleans. And one of the things that I did in that, that lecture, I was trying to create a rich drama about what was happening at the Battle of New Orleans. There we go, that's the one I want. Uh, trying to create a rich drama about what was happening at the Battle of New Orleans. And, you know, the point I was making in class is that no one was quite sure what was going to happen at New Orleans. That Andrew Jackson arrives on the scene, he doesn't have many men, he doesn't have a sizable contingent of forces, so he has to work with what he has. And he had a handful of regular U.S. troops, but then he also had Louisianans of French and Spanish descent. And as I was explaining in class, they didn't like one another. And then he had Kentuckians and he had Tennesseans, and they didn't like one another. And then he has Jean Lafitte and his Baratarian associates. And as I told my students in class, you know, they're a bunch of criminals. You know, they had been violating U.S. custom law. And then he also had two regiments of free men of color, and then he had slaves. And, of course, you can't forget the 52 Choctaw Indians he had. So what I'm trying to do is create this really rich drama about how Jackson cobbles together this multi-ethnic, multi-heterogeneous uh, force and ultimately is able to win. And this one student over in the corner raises his hands. He says, Dr. Smith. I mean, you just said he, Jackson had slaves. Well, the last class lecture, you said in the Chesapeake that the British were recruiting slaves. So who did the slaves side with, Jackson or the British? And I'm thinking, oh, crap. And that's exactly what I was thinking at the time. Just stand it up right there. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking, oh, crap. You know, first of all, he listened in class, and then, the, then he had the audacity to ask a question. So I decided, okay, I, I don't quite know the answer to this, so I will just, I'll go back to my office, I'll find the answer, I'll answer it next class period. Well, I went back to my office, couldn't find the answer, 
and the next class period, I just refused to make eye contact with him. And for the rest of the semester, I knew he was over there, I just didn't look at him. Well, he was a really good student. He took every dang class I offered. And we just had this uneasy understanding is that he would not ask that question, I would not offer that answer. Well, in the, the fall of 2012, when I was doing the final copy edits on this book, this student had gone on and graduated and had two masters and was teaching, and I knew where he was teaching at a private secondary school, and I sent him an email saying, you remember back in 1997, you asked me this question. I said, I have an answer for you. And if you really want to know, you need to buy the book. Well, he did buy the book because I, I, uh, I cited his name in the acknowledgement. But really, now while that story may say, sound apocryphal, it, it really did happen. And it's the way that historians come to projects that they want to work on. This was a project that I had always kind of been interested in, but I didn't have the, the drive to do it. And it took me 15 years to finish it. And really, it's a story, as I come to find out, it's a story not just of making a decision between Americans and the British. I mean, ultimately, it was a multi-cornered decision. You could join with the British. You could join with the Americans. Slaves could join with the Spanish. They could join with Native American communities. They could also join with renegade uh, maroon communities and ultimately there were as many as five choices and depending on the choice that these individuals made that would determine their outcome of their future lives so today I want to offer you some stories about the Battle of New Orleans so we can perhaps get a better understanding of what was the experience of slaves and free men of color and why they make the choices they ultimately do now, you guys probably know that the War of 1812, it begins in the summer of 1812. Uh, the war had been gearing up for a number of years. But once it begins, British policymakers and military officers are quickly reminded that they have a colony up there in Canada and that the fate of that colony, to them, surprisingly lay, of all places, down here along the Gulf Coast. Because... As long as you control the rivers and the outlet to those rivers, then you could control this region here. So they understood from the very beginning of the war that they have to hold on to Canada and that the Gulf Coast lay as the future of holding on to Canada. In fact, November 1812, only five months after the war begins, Sir John Borlase Warren, who's the commander of the British squadron in North American waters, he proposed a diversion against New Orleans. As he said, it would relieve the siege against Canada. And he said, an operation could close the Mississippi River as well as cut off the resources of the American southern states, which are now employed against the Canadas. A year later, Warren again called for his country to make some strike, strike some decisive stroke against the enemy, preferably a vigorous attack to the southward, taking possession of New Orleans, bringing forward the Indians and the Spaniards, and even a division of black troops to cut off the resources of the Mississippi. Now, during 1813, a number of other British officers make similar suggestions for a British victory. This man here, James Sterling, he's one of the most, he was one of the, um, he was an officer who had a lot of foresight about what the British could hope to accomplish. And the wonderful thing about it, the historic New Orleans collection in the city has this wonderful detailed memorandum that he wrote in, in 1813, which is called the um, uh, Memorandum about Louisiana. And he says that Louisiana was very open to attack. And he sends this report to the First Lord of the Admiralty, Viscount Melville, and he says that the conquest of Louisiana by British forces supported by Indians, by blacks, by 
displeased Spaniards would, according to Sterling, place the interior states of Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, and part of Virginia at the mercy of Great Britain. Well, the interesting thing about that memorandum, I'd been trying to find out information about Sterling for years. And I spent a year, better part of a year and a half in the United Kingdom working on this project. And whenever I had a chance, I'd look up you know, uh, personnel records. And I tried to find this guy Sterling. Couldn't find him anywhere in the Admiralty records. It was like the guy disappeared. Well, in 2005, I had the good fortune to go to, to Sydney, Australia. And lo and behold, I go to a bookshop, and there's his picture. He ends up in Australia in 1813. And he spends the rest of his career there, ultimately becoming the Governor General of Australia. So he's not in the Admiralty Office, he's in the Colonial Office. So I was never able to find him. So fortunately, this is what the guy looks like. You now know. But in any case, long before assuming command of the British squadron in North American waters during the spring of 1814, as you've heard this name before, uh, Admiral Alexander Forrester, English Cochrane, good Scottish name. Uh, he had detailed, a, he had drafted a detailed strategic plan, and he had discussed it at length with the Admiralty Office. And in that report, his operational plan, he suggested that a small force of regulars, Indians, Baratarian pirates, disaffected citizens, and black slaves. Now that's the key there. That's the key to Cochrane's plan for taking New Orleans. Regulars, Indians, pirates, disaffected citizens, black slaves. He said, should he get all of their support, you could take possession of New Orleans, and that would weaken the American war effort against Canada. So Cochrane introduced this plan long before he assumed command of the the North American Squadron. And it's a plan that's virtually the same as Warren's a year before. But when he finally receives command in the spring of 1814, he's able to begin implementing this plan. And in August 1814, the, uh, the Admiralty finally approves Cochrane's plan, and he would begin putting that into effect. Now, the problem is, when Cochrane takes command, in the spring of 1814, he learns that the southern Indians, that they are also fighting against the United States. Yet Cochrane did not truly appreciate that the southern Indians were also involved in a civil war amongst themselves. The Creeks, one faction remained loyal to the U.S. government, another faction began fighting against the Americans, and that hostile faction suffered a devastating defeat against Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend in late March 1814 there on the uh, Tallapoosa River. Now, Cochran did not know that the Creeks had suffered that debilitating defeat. He did not realize that the other southern tribes, the Cherokee and the Choctaw, that they had completely sided with the United States. In fact, all that Cochran knew was that there was a sizable number of Indians in the South. They were fighting a common foe, the United States. So Cochran sends, sends Captain Hugh Piggott and a small complement of men to the Gulf states with arms and supplies for the Indians. He sends Brevet Captain George Woodbine, who stays among the Indians, throughout the summer and fall of 1814, training, drilling, supplying, feeding. Throughout, Woodbine convinced himself. And you read the reports, and Woodbine is blowing hot air up Cochran's skirt, or perhaps his kilt. But Co uh, Woodbine is convincing himself, reporting to Cochran, that the Indians were potentially powerful allies who could be counted on during the Louisiana campaign. However, Cochran learned by early December that these southern Indians that were hostile to the United States could contribute very little to British operations. In fact, Cochran, in fact, what happens here is Cochran is prevented from using that one segment of his plan, the Indians, 
to supplement his force. So what about Jean Lafitte and the Baratarians? Well, as you well know, Lafitte and his associates represented a potential source of soldiers for Cochrane that he wanted to employ during his Louisiana campaign. We know that the Baratarians, based on the Isle of Barat uh, the island of Barataria to the south and west of the city, that this lawless group had been operating a prosperous smuggling ring that supplied slaves and other contraband to the citizens of New Orleans, and they had become somewhat prosperous doing so. The Baratarians blatantly plundered foreign merchant ships, disregarded international neutrality laws, violated American revenue laws, and the U.S. government could do little to suppress their activity prior to September 1814. Cochran seized on the idea that the Baratarians could provide assistance by either joining with the British or by remaining neutral. And in early September, he sent Captain Nicholas Lockyer to meet with Lafitte, and for two days the men discussed the prospects of an alliance in which the Baratarians would provide their assistance and knowledge, and in return the British would offer to protect and aid the pirates in their struggle against the U.S. Well, you probably know this story, is that Lafitte refused the British officer, he chose to join the Americans, and by doing so, he deprived Cochran of that second source of manpower. But not just a second source of manpower. He deprived Cochran of an important source of vital information regarding the geography of the region. So think about it. Cochran is now, there we go. He was supposed to pop up automatically. Sorry about that. So, finding himself disappointed in his attempt to recruit the Baratarians and the Indians, Cochrane turned to the disaffected population. In fact, he mistakenly thought that they were, as he wrote, quote-unquote, very anxious to get rid of the Americans. Cochrane had been led to believe that the disposition of the region's inhabitants toward Britain was as various and motley as the population itself. He had been told that the Spaniards supported their country, the French supported theirs, but both groups worked primarily against the Americans. And this prompts Cochrane and the British ministry to project that an expeditionary force just might find inhabitants, find in the inhabitants a general and decided disposition to withdraw from their recent connection with the United States. If he found this attitude, Cochrane was instructed to secure both their favor and their cooperation. If Cochrane did so, he believed, he earnestly believed, that the British would receive the whole province of Louisiana from the United States. Well, we know that that's not going to happen either. So, for Cochrane, unable to receive the assistance of Indians, of the Baratarians, and of the general Spanish and Louisiana, uh, French population, Cochrane could turn to slaves. And slaves, as we know, could determine the course of the war along the Gulf. Uh, Cochrane's subordinate, Admiral George Coburn, and you've got to love, that's his official portrait in the Greenwich Maritime Museum. And what do you see in the background? A conflagration, a fire. And that's him burning the city of Washington, D.C. And, of course, he's got this smirk on his face there. But in any case, uh, George Coburn had proven during uh, 1813 and the spring of 1814 that most Virginia cities, most cities that surrounded the Chesapeake, could be assaulted easily with small mobile forces because of the abundance of navigable rivers. Now, these attacks had thrown the Virginia countryside into complete disarray. Coburn had asserted that the slave population, and he said this, who were British in their hearts, might be of great use as if the war should be prosecuted with vigor. I mean, we knew, they knew, the Americans knew. 
that slave labor provided the foundation for the southern economy, and, Coburn, and Cochran and Coburn both understood that any disruptions would leave Americans in a complete state of panic. In fact, the mere presence of a British fleet off the American coast created this horrible double-edged sword for Americans. Think about it. If you are a plantation owner and the American military being based on the militia and you're being called out when a British sail appears off the coast, will you grab your musket off the hearth and you go down to the shore to meet the enemy. Well, if you're a slaveholder, you've got to constantly look over your shoulder to make sure your slaves are not running away or rising in revolt. And the presence of the British fleet, it emboldened slaves to flight. It also made the countryside virtually indefensible. And Americans faced greater problems after Cochrane issued this proclamation in April 1814 in which he promised refugee slaves would not be returned to their masters. They would be given land in a British colony. In fact, I often tell my students here, you see this right here? Um, to all those who may be deposed, I can read this for you, but what you'll notice is that it's one sentence. It's what I often refer to my students as a long run-on sentence. And if you can read it in one breath, you're quite talented. But what he says, to all those, he's not talking just about slaves or black men, to all men, to all women who may be disposed to immigrate to the United Kingdom Empire. Well, this creates a very powerful incentive for slaves to flee to the British and forced Americans to be even more vigilant and alert should militia remain at home to meet, to meet the, the enemy than slaves would run away. If militia did not come out to meet the enemy, then the British could raid and plunder without fear. In, any, in either case, the British benefited greatly. Now, for example, during his campaign in the, the Chesapeake, Cochran had encouraged slaves to run away, and he had enlisted those willing to take up arms against their former masters. In fact, he armed about 600 of these men, converting them into colonial marines. Now, although this image here is of one of the West Indian marines, you can get it, still get an idea of what these, these marines would have resembled. He believed that outfitting and arming them could alter the course of the war because it demoralized the Americans, and it truly did in the Chesapeake. Cochran also had, instruct, had insisted that thousands of slaves would join on, upon their master's horses simply because of their hatred of the citizens of the United States. In fact, Cochran found so little difficulty in recruiting slaves and employing them during the successful Chesapeake campaign that he also thought he would find the same situation along the Gulf Coast. Besides, reports from Florida and Louisiana already indicated that there was a strong and irresist irresistible party in the free people of color and the slaves who will to a man join the British cause. Now, true, runaway slaves fled from Georgia and the Mississippi Territory to the British base on Apalachicola in Spanish Florida, but they did not participate in or alter the outcome of the Louisiana campaign. More importantly, very few Louisiana slaves that Cochran anticipated would don red coats actually did, and fewer still participated in the Louisiana campaign. What happens instead? Very simply, Andrew Jackson persuaded slave and free blacks from Louisiana, from the Florida parishes, to join the American cause. He promised, he guaranteed a full and entire pardon to slaves who helped defend the city, and he promised a monetary and land bounty to those, what he called those sons of freedom, or free blacks who joined his cause. Jackson's proclamation ultimately 
denied to Cochrane and the British another important source of much needed manpower. Now, Jackson had warned Louisiana Governor William C.C. C. Claiborne in the early fall of 1814 of British intentions to move against Mobile and New Orleans and to excite the black population to insurrection and massacre. Claiborne reassured Jackson that the free black militia reconstituted in September 1812, that these, these men, these fighting men, these organized, propertied, free black men, that they could be counted on as long as they were commanded by white officers. He, Claiborne said they had served Louisiana under Spain with the greatest firmness and courage and while the state legislature had expressed misgivings and doubt about reconstituting the free black militia, Claiborne promised Jackson that these men were inured to climate. They were loyal to Louisiana and the United States. More importantly, Claiborne said they had good characters, extensive connections, and perhaps even more important, extensive property to defend. They represented men of status and class. And should the U.S. not embrace these men of color, Claiborne warned that the enemy will be encouraged to intrigue and to corrupt them. In fact, when British forces seized Pensacola, Florida in September 1814, Jackson knew at that point that their future objectives would be Mobile and New Orleans and that the British intended to co-opt the region's slaves and free blacks. Cochran, Cochran's operative, Colonel Edward Nichols, had constructed Negro Fort there on the Apalachicola River. He had been recruiting Indians and runaway slaves, arming them, training them to be soldiers. And he brought with him, Nichols brought with him copies of Cochran's proclamation and also a proclamation that he himself wrote. And in that proclamation, he said, he begged that the men of color unrivet the chains of thousands of your color now lingering in bonds. He promised them that for a short tenure in the British military, they could secure solid property with the rights of an Englishman that they could pass on to their children forever. He extolled them to adopt the British bayonet, and by doing so, they could arrive at the haven of peace and have happiness surround their firesides and amply reward their hardships. His promises appealed to the black population of both Spanish West and East Florida as many rallied to the British standard in this area, ultimately leaving the Gulf Coast teetering on the brink of a potential full-scale slave insurrection. That mean I'm supposed to stop? <laughs> In a September address to the Louisiana white citizens, Jackson had warned against Negro assassins who would become slaves to Great Britain. Yet in a separate address to the free colored inhabitants of Louisiana, he pleaded for their assistance. He desperately called them sons of freedom, brave fellow citizens. Americans, even adopted children. He knew they had been deprived of their chance to defend their country. He begged them to defend all which is dear in existence. Those who did, he promised, would be paid the same bounty and money and lands as white soldiers. Those who followed the path to glory would receive the applause and gratitude of their country. Well, those are polished words. Claiborne did not publish Jackson's appeal to the free men of color until late October because many whites distrusted this class of people. Many excellent citizens, Claiborne reported, supposed that by putting arms in the hands of men of color, we only add to the force of the enemy. The White New Orleans Committee of Defense surprisingly endorsed Jackson's 
proposal provided, and listen to this, provided that there could be a guarantee against the return of the regiment when the war is over. So, in effect, what this white defense committee is asking for is that they really wanted to hire black soldiers as mercenaries, pay them after the crisis, and then send them off far away from New Orleans once the war is over. Jackson's appeal to the free men of color did not pay immediate dividends. In fact, many Louisianans protested that the, pro the proclamation put blacks on par with white citizens, which they believed to be exceedingly objectionable. Some complained that Jackson's appeal called free men of color fellow citizens and countrymen. Now, despite the complaints, Jackson, Claiborne, and the free men of color all saw advantages to joining. In fact, white planner and merchant Colonel Michel Fortier Sr. There we go. Uh, provided arms to uh, funds to arm and equip the first battalion of freemen of color. And in mid-December, Major Pierre Lacoste led the men to the ship, the ship Mentor to prevent the British from taking that road to the city. The first battalion of free men of color. As we've heard, there are various discrepancies about how many men there are. Consisted of 353 men, including staff officers and an 11-piece band headed by shopkeeper Bartholomew Campanelle. The men of the battalion elected, elected shoemaker Vincent Populus to command them in the field. The six companies of black had black company officers, and many of the men had long histories of military service to Louisiana. Joiners, Balthazar de Mosier and Jean Louis Doyo, Louis Danoy cabinet maker Charles Poiré, auctioneer Pierre Bailly. They had all signed an 1804 free men of color petition to Governor Claiborne and had served in the militia under the Spanish flag. Cabinet maker Louis Simon had fought against the Chickasaw during the 18th century, while Noel Carrier had served with Bernardo Galvez during the American Revolution. Others were traditional skilled occupations. Had, others had traditional skilled occupations. They were carpenters, carters, shoemakers, draymen, bricklayers, bakers, gardeners, tailors, musicians, grocers. In fact, this first battalion, a group, as they called themselves, chosen men of color, represented an important element a black lower middle class professional society. They owned property and anticipated that performing their civic obligations would win for them broader rights as citizens. Fortier also provided arms and equipment for a second battalion that consisted of black refugees from Santa Domingo.
their material possessions. Some even volunteered without shoes and the blankets they needed for a cold weather campaign, which further demonstrated their willingness to sacrifice in order to gain what they perceived as recognition and acceptance. In addition, Captain Alexandre LeMay commanded the 50-man Louisiana 15th Regiment of Free Men of Color, while Chap Captain Charles Fournay commanded a 31-soldier free, free Men of Color company. Other free blacks fought with different regular and militia units, including, as we've heard, a 14-year-old drummer boy named Jordan Noble. As Jackson rallied soldiers to the Stars and Stripes, Governor Claiborne pleaded with Louisiana's white citizens to send slaves to help construct fortifications for the city. Planters from the surrounding area furnished thousands of slaves. Jackson's engineer, Arsene Le Carrier Latour, used many of these slaves to construct batteries on the west side of the river and to build ramparts at Chalmette. In fact, according to a rumor, a black laborer named Pompey gave Jackson the idea of using cotton bells to reinforce his artillery emplacements at Chalmette. Now, perhaps the story is apocryphal, but nonetheless, it illustrates the centrality of slaves and free blacks to the New Orleans defense story. Jackson also worked to eliminate the specter of a servile insurrection by co-opting slaves into his ranks. A January 1811 slave insurrection north of New Orleans had created a persistent fear about an uprising. It exacerbated, further exacerbated when Louisianans received news that British forces landing along the Gulf were rallying slaves as they marched toward New Orleans. But Jackson, he's able to prevent such a widespread possibility by recruiting slaves to join his own cause. One slave named James Roberts recalled some years later that Jackson came to his Natchez area plantation to enlist slaves. Roberts claims that Jackson promised if the battle is fought and the victory gained, you shall be free. This prospect of freedom motivated Roberts, he said, and many of his fellow slaves who volunteered, they traveled to New Orleans, and according to Roberts himself, the prospect of freedom permitted him to overcome fear and dread and fight with ferocity, completely insensitive to pain. In fact, Robert himself lost his left forefinger and he suffered a severe head wound during the battle. And although the general later acknowledged the bravery of these men, once the campaign had been determined and the crisis averted, Jackson refused to grant them their freedom, claiming that he could not take another man's property and set it free. Jackson reportedly told the slaves to go home and mind their masters. Though Jackson did not grant the slaves freedom, his recruitment of them certainly undermined British plans to use them to destabilize Louisiana. Admiral Cochran had found so little difficulty recruiting slaves in the Chesapeake that he anticipated similar results during his expedition along the slave-holding Gulf. He had received reports from Florida, Louisiana, indicating numerous slaves were willing to join their cause against the Americans yet not in the numbers that the British anticipated. In fact, only about 300 slaves chose to leave with the British after the Battle of New Orleans. So throughout the fall of 1814, Cochran had gotten very little help from those that he anticipated receiving help from. The Baratarian pirates, the Indians, were not the fighting force he anticipated. Baratarians had not chosen to join with the British. The Spanish and French population had not embraced the British as liberators, but instead viewed them as conquerors. 
And finally, black slave soldiers had not swelled British ranks, as Cochrane anticipated. Nor had their flight created a hardship for the United States. Nonetheless, Cochrane chose to continue his operations against New Orleans. And we know what happened. The New Orleans campaign had a very different perspective on black participation during the War of 1812. Blacks fought on all sides, British, American, Spanish, Native American, African Americans. In the Chesapeake, for example, there had been no sustained history of free black communities or any participation in civic life. Slave labor there girded the economy and white society found themselves at the mercy of a potential slave insurrection. And British forces exploited that fear, leaving Americans in the region doubly exposed by redcoats and slaves. And this dichotomy had provided slaves and free blacks the opportunity to, to exercise agency. In that region, in the Chesapeake, more than 2,000 slaves fled to the British fleet where they were evacuated to Bermuda, Canada, eventually Trinidad, some owned to Belize. Some 600 enlisted in the Colonial Marines and along with black West Indian regiments fought at Washington, Baltimore, and some at New Orleans. Unfortunately, military service did not elevate the status of Louisiana's free blacks. Instead, it created renewed suspicion and distrust. Their service did not win for them immediate state pensions, federal land warrants, or the bounties that Jackson had promised. A few black soldiers did receive immediate pensions but those had to be renewed periodically by the state legislatures. Others, including Joseph Savory, received pensions inter <laughs> intermittently throughout the 1830s and 1840s. Many of the men did not receive their pension, did not have their pensions granted until the late 1840s, the early 1850s. And by that time, many of them had passed and their descendants end up selling the the grants rather than holding on to the property themselves. But I would like to finish here with the story of a 14-year-old slave, Jordan Banks and Noble. He had been born a mulatto in Augusta, Georgia in October 1800. He arrived in New Orleans in 1811. He participated with the 7th U.S. Regiment. And at that time, he remained a slave. He does not secure his freedom until the 1830s. Now, though only a teenager, Noble nonetheless handled his drum like a veteran. And being a drummer is not simply a ceremonial or a superfluous position. When you are in combat and smoke covers the field and there is you know, the constant sound of muskets being fired and cannon being fired, the way you convey orders is through the beat of the drum. So the drummer boy is essential to the communication on the battlefield. So Jordan Noble held an important position. And it was an important position that a young man could fulfill. He kept a steady beat. He led Major Daquin's company to meet the British on the night fighting of December 23rd, 1814. And on January 8th, 1815, at Chalmette, the rattle of his drum was heard even amidst the din of battle in the hottest hell of fire. <coughs> After the war, Noble remained in Louisiana, I mean in New Orleans, he participates in the Seminole War in Florida, in the Mexican War, and in 1861, at the beginning of the American Civil War, he will raise a regiment of, of free blacks to fight for the, 
Confederacy. Now, when Union naval forces take New Orleans pretty early in the war, he would then raise a regiment of troops, free blacks, to fight for the Louisiana Home Guard. So he had no qualms about which side he would support. But one of the interesting things is that about 10 years before the Civil War began, 36 years after the Battle of New Orleans, in January 8, 1851, 90 free men of color marched for the first time in the annual January 8 parade in New Orleans. And after the parade, well, during the parade, I should say, Old Jordan provided the same drumbeat that he had provided on the plains of Chalmette years earlier. Now, at this point, he's marching, the, the free men of color marched in the center of the parade. And it was a symbol that they had finally achieved some notoriety, recognition. It was an honor long overdue. The Daily Picayune at that point rhetorically asked, who had endured the hardships of the camp or faced with greater courage the perils of the fight. Who more than they deserve the thanks of the country and the gratitude of successive generations. Finally, they had made an impression upon every observer present that day, even as they passed in a slow cadence that reflected their age. <coughs> Jordan Noble became a de facto leader of this aging group, as his drumbeat reminded all of the sacrifice they had endured in 1815. On January 8, 1860, black soldiers participated in the last major January 8 parade. This time, the free men of color still held a prominent place in the center of the parade. But as you can imagine, they now rode in carriages because they were you know, their marching days were over. Major General Winfield Scott requested that Jordan Noble be honored with a medal for his contributions to the Battle of New Orleans. And that evening, at, the, uh, at a prominent New Orleans hotel, Jordan Noble was presented to the veterans of the battle. And as the aging crowd became rowdy and cheering and applauding their fellow soldier, Nord Jordan Noble was called upon to give a few remarks. And he screamed out that he was ready to serve his country again, as he had done at New Orleans and Florida and in Mexico. Well, within two years, he got his chance in the Civil War. Now, Jordan Banks and Noble actually died in the early hours of June 20th, 1890. So he's 89 years old. The following day, the Daily Picayune sadly reported the death, the death of the drummer boy of Chalmette and ran a woodcut pitcher. There we go. Ran a woodcut pitcher of the colored veteran of four wars. Encouraged family and friends to attend his Saturday afternoon funeral so they could look on the white hair and the familiar face of old Jordan one last time. Finally, it stated that Noble had gone to join his comrades of many campaigns and he was laid to rest in the city St. Louis Cemetery, number two, square three. Jordan Noble's life spanned almost the entire 19th century. After his fighting days had passed, Noble and his well-worn drum still entertained audiences. His music provided an entree into respectability. Yet he held tightly onto his legacy as the drummer boy of the Battle of New Orleans. In effect, his drum embodied Jackson's victory, as well as the black contribution to and the memory of the Battle of New Orleans. His drum helped define how slaves and free blacks permitted Andrew Jackson to prevail in the face of daunting odds. <clears throat>
Yet the War of 1812 eliminated any possibility for African Americans to gain equality or status because it demonstrated to white Americans that armed, that armed slaves and free blacks represented an inherent danger to a growing and established white society in the South. The war also hastened, as we learned, the war has also, also hastened the removal of Native Americans east of the Mississippi, from east of the Mississippi River, opening up more farmlands and providing an impetus to a growing southern plantation agricultural system, which correspondingly reinvigorated slavery across the South. In effect, the War of 1812 laid the groundwork for understanding the racial issues that ultimately contributed to the American Civil War. Thank you. Questions? Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? You guys make up questions, I'll make up answers. <laughs> All right, we have one. Uh, in the current uh, Louisiana Cultural Vistas magazine that's out now, there's a biographical article about Jordan Noble, in case anyone wants to get a I copy. I haven't seen it yet, yeah. In fact, I... I in doing this book here, I, I did a lot of work, research on Noble, and I'm kind of playing with the idea that he may be one of my next projects. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Dr. Smith, uh, could you speak to the precursor of the British overtures to blacks uh, prior to the War of 1812, like in the American Revolution? Well, in fact, in the book, yeah, I, I hate to quit, keep hawking the book, um, in the book, the first chapter is a long discourse on the use of blacks by both the American colonials and by other fighting forces. So it was not uncommon. In fact, there had been a, a sizable uh, British, Ro I mean, a, a, a American Rhode Island contingent during the American Revolution. Um, Lord Dunmore in 1776 guaranteed or promised freedom to slaves who would side with the British in the, in the Virginia waters. So it was not an uncommon occurrence, but it really surprised Americans that in 1812, 13, 14, that slaves would decide to join with the British rather than stay loyal to the Americans. And there's all these wonderful stories about how once the British had liberated slaves, they kept them in the Chesapeake at a place called Tangier Island. And all these plantation owners decide, well, they want to go appeal to their slaves, and they certainly can convince their slaves to come back. And the, uh, um, Admiral Warren and then Admiral Cochran both permit plantation owners to go aboard ship and talk to their slaves. And these masters come aboard, and their, their slaves there are assembled on the deck, and they, they plead to their slaves, you know, come back to your, your warm homes. Come back where you are well fed. Come back to where you're well treated. And guess how many choose to go back? None. Yeah, in fact, I got a wonderful anecdote about a guy named uh, Charles Ball, who's a slave in um, Calvert County, Maryland. And he's actually a fugitive slave at this point in time. And in the spring of uh, the early summer of 18, uh, 1813, he joins a group of white masters aboard a ship. And of course, the slaves choose not to go. And the masters ask Charles Ball to stay aboard the ship during the night and, you know, cajole them, convince them that it'd be in their best interest to come. Well, he spends a night with them, and of course, none choose to go back to their masters. And as he's getting off the boat, a British officer said, do you want to join us as a free man in a British colony? And Charles Ball said, no, sir, I am a free man. I have all the land to work that I can work. Well, he had constructed, consciously constructed an identity for himself as a free man when in fact he is a fugitive slave and it comes back to haunt him horribly later. You've got to buy the book to find out. Um, thanks. Uh, Jackson's seeming betrayal of the promise that he made, what's your understanding of how that came about? I mean, was that, uh, 
that he was really manipulating people, lying to them consciously, um, or were Jackson's there doing anything and everything he can to win. You know, he does not want to be, for example, William Winder is a name that in 1812 studies goes down in infamy because he's the commander of American forces when the British march into Washington. And Jackson does not want to go down in infamy like William Winder does. So he, he is going to do everything in his power to not end up in that situation. So the fact that he reneges on an offer, I, I see that, I mean, think about Jackson. He's a slaveholder himself. He's, he's, he's going to do what's necessary to win. I mean, I'm, I am certainly no fan of Jackson. Uh -huh. uh, my, my mentor, a man I studied under for my doctoral degree, was a guy named Frank Lawrence Owsley who wrote a pretty popular, pretty important book called The Struggle for the Gulf Borderlands. Well, his mom, and, uh, his mom had been the first editor of the Andrew Jackson papers. So I had to live with Jackson up to here, <laughs> and I just, I just have no use for him. Do you have an opinion on the... I have, I have lots of opinions. Well, in this particular case, because yeah. you, you alluded to militias, and uh, do you have a view about whether the militia clause in the Constitution... Were, were militias basically con, uh, organized to suppress potential black slave rebellions, or do you have an... You know what I'm talking about? Militias are, are for defense, and the meaning of defense varied from parts of the country to other parts. For example, if you're in New England in the 18th century where it was a problem with Native Americans, that's what they were concerned about. In 1800, if you're in Richmond at the time of the, uh, the Gabriel Revolt and the militia is called out to suppress the Gabriel Rebellion, that's defense. So it, it all depends on where you're at and what the circumstances are. There's someone over this way oh. as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Quick question. So, um, just kind of to, to piggyback on this, given the betrayal, is there any uh, written documentation as far as response from slaves that had done their part and, you know, left whatever the, you know, whatever fighting position they were in and expected something and didn't get it? Was there any response from them? Was there any feedback? Are there any stories? Do you know anything? Well, in, in, my, in my book, I do use a number of slave narratives. Now, granted, any time you use a slave narrative, there are inherent problems with it. You know, um, first of all, is it written actually by the slave itself, or was it written by an abolitionist? You know, is it written as a propaganda piece, or is it written as a, a true account of events? Um, the, the one that I cite in uh, uh, the slave at uh, New Orleans is James Roberts. And it's a, it's a controversial piece. I chose to cite it because it conveyed exactly what happens. And, you know, it, it's written in mid-1830s. And at that point, Jackson is still president. So is it a part of the political campaign against Jackson? Is it a Whig treatise? Uh, more than likely it is. But... You know, I, as a historian, I had to choose whether I was going to use it or not. Conversely, I also used Charles Ball's memoir that is 1838, and it tells a much different story. So, sorry, I can't be more precise than that. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Smith, um, I was curious. I remember reading about the British, you know, they were wanting to recruit the slaves. However... I read something about there's a prison in uh, London. Or Can you speak up? I'm, I'm, I don't hear so well. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the British has a prison in L London. Do you, can you, um, they put the blacks in the prisons, the slaves, when they got over there? Well, you know, the, there's, a, there's a lot of debate over what happens. One of the things that I, that I did in this book that really created some uncomfortable feelings um, there's the question over how many slaves were evacuated, how many were liberated, how many were evacuated from the coast of North America. And in the early 1820s, there's a commission, because, you know, the War of 1812 ends with that status quo antebellum. You've got to hate that damn thing, because it settles nothing. So you have all these commissions set up after, between the United States and Great Britain, and 
1823, there's one between the United States and Great Britain about the, 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 um, the slave liberations. And ultimately, they have to get the Tsar of Russia to mediate this because the question was, how many slaves did the British abscond with? That's the way the Americans would describe it. How many did they abscond with? Well, the Americans said, oh, my God, there was probably seven, 8,000. Well, the British said, no, 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 no. There's only about 3,000. Well, you know, that's a pretty wide discrepancy. That's about 4,000 difference. Well, I decided, okay, let's see if we can get to what the, the root of this number is. And the one thing you've got to love about the British, they are meticulous record keepers, especially the British Navy, because the, the British were liberating slaves in the Chesapeake. They were taking them to Tangier Island, which is there in the South Chesapeake. And every time they brought a supply ship in from Bermuda, it was loaded with men and supplies. They offloaded the supplies. They offloaded the troops. They loaded the, the refugees on the ship. Then they took them to Bermuda. Well, aboard a ship, there's an officer called a purser. In effect, he's the accountant of the ship. And he has to keep track of where every penny is spent. And what that meant is every ration of food, if he could not account for it, it came out of his pocket. So this guy is keeping meticulous records because he doesn't want anything to come out of his pocket. So you get a number from how many are boarding ships and how many are being taken to Bermuda. Well, once they get off at Bermuda, then they are transferred to the colonial office. And there, there's a lower level bureaucrat who's almost the same role. He's got to keep track of how many miles he's feeding. And if he doesn't, it comes out of his pocket. So he's keeping very detailed records. And then they'd be put back on ship and shipped off to Canada. Well, conversely again, the purser and then the colonial office official. So just by following those lower ranking bureaucrats and start tallying those numbers together, you know, I'm able to come up with roughly 4,800. That's very different from what the British said and what the Americans said. Well, the Tsar of Russia mediating this dispute, guess which way he leans? Fellow monarch. He said it's roughly about the same as the British. What that meant is that the British offered restitution, financial restitution for that many slaves. And ultimately that money was paid back to slaveholders over the course of the next 20, 30 years. And many of them got just a fraction of what they lost. In fact, there's a, a, a historic home along the, uh, along the Patuxent called the Sodderly Plantation. It's in Maryland, Southern Maryland. And on one night they lost like 50 slaves and they only got paid for like 20 of them. So it, it was a financial loss that they never were able to recover from. In fact, if you go to the eastern shore of Maryland today, it's really kind of, it's, you, you can still see the effects of what happened during the War of 1812 because they took a financial loss that they're never, they were never able to recover from. I'm, I'm rambling, so sorry about that. Wait a minute, wait a minute, we got, he, the guy, microphone guy. I'm just, I'm just getting excited here. By or through what authority was Jackson able to make this representation or promise? I'm sorry, speak up. So, by or through what authority was Jackson able to make the representation or the promise? Is well, you know, when Jackson arrives, he declares martial law. So he took it solely on his authority as the commanding officer in a crisis situation. And in fact, as you, you probably well know, he ends up, uh, having a federal judge in prison, you know, thrown into jail because you know, this judge had ruled against Jackson and uh, doesn't eventually release him until after March when he's finally convinced that the British are evacuating. Yeah, the, the first question I had, which was, uh, how did he have the authority and did he get in trouble for making such a promise that the United States government wasn't going to back up? Uh, I guess in the short time from strength between him arriving and the end of the battle, that, that never came out in terms of anything against Jackson. No, no, no. And in fact, you know, it's interesting. This judge fined him $1,000 and, uh, you know, Jackson paid the fine. And, you know, three decades later, you know, right up literally to his death, his supporters are trying to push through legislation 
to get Congress to rest, you know, to pay back that thousand dollars that Jackson had been fined. Right. My, my second question is my own personal confusion. That's okay. I have when, that problem you, all the when time. When you gave the statistics of who was with Jackson in your very beginning of your talk, I thought you said that in terms of slaves, it was something like 58 slaves. No, I said Almost 52 else, Choctaw Indians. No, but there was also a mention of a small slave brigade at some point. I, no, I said there are about 600 free men of color. Correct. But and no, I never give a number of slaves because I don't know exactly how many were okay, there. Well, that, therein lies my confusion. Yeah. We're talking about Jackson having promised to slaves. How, what effect at all would that have had upon these 600 men of color? In fact, well, some and, of in which fact, I think it would have had a himself. huge impact. I'm convinced that had Jackson, had Jackson given the slaves who had fought for him their freedom, then all of a sudden it would have placed them on par, on the same level as these free men of color, who were, you know, artisans and they were bakers and carpenters and bricklayers and. You know, by doing such, it would have completely unhinged uh, well, that, that's kind of black my point. society. So they yeah. would not have been in favor of it. But we're, well, making, we're making this big argument that Jackson offered freedom to slaves as if some slaves did come and fight at the battle. But in essence, there were very few slaves who fought at the battle. In fact, they were free men of color who fought well, at the but, battle. But there, were also, there was also slaves. He had, he had hundreds of slaves that were digging fortification. Now, those were not the ones that were promised freedom. But we do know that according to the rumors, the reports, there were hundreds of slaves that were carrying arms, that were fighting for him. Um, and those are the ones that are not given their freedom. To me, it's, it's, it's the issue that Jackson made a promise that was not fulfilled. And I dislike him for a number of other reasons, so it just adds fuel to the fire. Good questions, guys. Keeping me on my toes today. Thank you for the presentation. A couple of questions, sure. if, if allowed. Uh, wondering, what did Jackson offer to the slave owners that he was offering the freedom to those slaves to? Was he promising restitution to them? That's one question. The second question I had. Well, before you ask yes, that part, yes, let me tell you that the slaves who fought Jackson provided their owners nothing. This was their patriotic duty. Okay. Thank you. So no compensation there. Okay. Uh, and the colonial Marines, the, the slaves that left up in Maryland in and on the East Coast, yeah. in Chesapeake, thank you, uh, that joined, were they, w curious what eventually happened to them, and I'm curious, did they fight under white British officers, or did they elect their own officers to fight under, or what, what happened? You know, it's, um, it's interesting you mention that. There was a, a sergeant named Charles Hammond who was uh, promoted to an ensign rank, which is kind of the middle between an NCO and an officer, um, because he had been working with these colonial marines in the field. And one of the interesting things about it, most of these guys turn out to be outstanding soldiers because, you know, they just didn't want to go back to slavery. Now, another story I have in the book is of a guy named Ned Simmons. He had, he had been a Nathaniel Green slave during the American Revolution, so he had been by Green's side in the Revolution. And he had fought diligently. In fact, reportedly, he was also a, a, quite a proficient fifer. And he'd played his fife at least on three occasions for George Washington in Washington's tent. Now, after the war, after the revolution, of course, Green is awarded land in the state of Georgia down on Cumberland Island. So he sets up his plantation in a place called Dungeness Plantation. And Ned Simmons goes back to the plantation and goes from being Green's trusted right-hand servant to his, you know, his companion in war to being a, a field hand. And Green ends up dying pretty quickly, and then all of a sudden, Ned Simmons ping-pongs around the family because the wife and the son and the daughter, none of them really want to have custodian of the slaves. Well, Ned Simmons, in January 1815, when the British land on, on um, Cumberland Island, and when I tell my students this, my students go, wait a minute, Dr. Smith, that's wrong! The war is over on Christmas Day, 1814. You know, they signed that Treaty of Ghent. 
yeah, but they don't have Skype, they don't have email, you know, they, it's not an instantaneous end. And in fact, news of the end of the war doesn't arrive to the South Atlantic until mid-March. So in January 1813, George Coburn, that guy with the fires behind him, he invades Cumberland Island. He liberates over a period of about two and a half months, he liberates 1,700 slaves. One of them, Ned Simmons. In fact, Ned Simmons would be the, one of the first to choose to join the Colonial Marines. He makes his mark on the muster roll. And in fact, he is such a proficient soldier that even George Coburn comments, this guy Ned Simmons is an outstanding soldier. And in fact, think about it. Here's a 65-year-old man who is an outstanding soldier. Well, hell, he'd been a soldier in the Revolution. Well, Coburn thinks he's so good at what he's doing. He would leave him there on Cumberland Island to serve as an example to every other slave that makes it to the island, what they too can accomplish. So he stays on the island, given a uniform and musket. He's an example. Well, mid-March, American commissioners arrive saying, the war's over. The British have to return all seized property, including slaves. Well, Coburn stalls for the better part of a week while he's evacuating slaves from the island. Ultimately, about 80 slaves are turned back over to the Americans. Ned Simmons, one of them. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. The family's oral tradition says that when he was turned back over to the Americans, they took his weapon from him, and then they began taking his uniform, stripping his uniform off. And as they stripped his uniform off, he held on to it. And as they literally had to pry it out of his hand, he pulled a brass button off. He held onto that brass button. That was a prize symbol. How close he had come to freedom. Well, Ned Simmons eventually gets his freedom. When? 1863. He's 103 years old. He and his 70-year-old daughter will escape under cover of darkness, fleeing across Confederate lines to the town of Fernandina, there on the coast of Florida and Georgia, where Union troops will receive him, and they provide him clothing and shelter. Um, there's some missionary women there that begin to work with him, and they teach Ed Simmons how to read as a 103 years old. And he, he tells his life story, and there's a newspaper reporter there, and the newspaper reporter comes over and begins recording his story and how this guy knew George Washington. The last interview he gives, he says something to the effect that if I were to die today, I could at least go to the Lord knowing I'm a free man. He died about two weeks later. Now in mid-1990s, U.S. Park Service began doing excavations on Cumberland Island. And as they were digging in the largest of the slave cabins, they uncovered a brass button from an 1808 British uniform, which substantiated the family's oral tradition. And it's in a nice filing cabinet down in Jacksonville. So, I mean, there's all these wonderful stories about what happens. But ultimately, for most of these slaves, it was a question of, would they run? Would they try to get their freedom, or would they not? And I was giving this talk, uh, a similar talk, to a group at a black genealogical society. And this lady stood up afterward and said, so you're telling me that 4,800 slaves escaped? That's not many. I said, well, granted. I mean, at this time, there's roughly 1.1 million slaves in the United States and only 4,800 or so escaped, that's less than 3%. That's, um, yeah, that's, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a mathematician. Some of you math people can figure this out. It's not many. But I asked her, I said, if one slave got their freedom, isn't that enough? Well, she backed down and said, yep, that's enough. Um, but the point is, the ones who fled became refugees and were shipped to Bermuda, some stayed in Bermuda, most end up going to Canada, and you know, you know what they find out in Canada? 
they find out, dang, it's cold there. You know, they're, they're, they're field hands from the Carolinas and Georgia and Virginia and Maryland. And it's hard to grow things in the rocky, barren soil with a short growing season. And ultimately, the governor of Trinidad, uh, beginning about 1816, he tries to start recruiting these refugees from Canada and say, come to Trinidad, it's warmer, it's warmer. And most of them say, yeah, but you still have slavery on Trinidad. We're not too eager to go back to that. Finally, in 1823, a group of about a thousand say, okay, we've had enough of the cold, we're going to Trinidad. And they take them and put them right in the middle of the island and tell these, these refugees, you cannot have contact with any of the slaves on the island. If you do, you will sacrifice your freedom. And basically tell them that you can stay here as long as you are productive workers. Because if they didn't work, what would happen is the jungle would grow back over them. So ultimately, the British government is using them to clear the middle of the island. Now, the interesting thing about it, those people that moved to Trinidad, they're a group that still today strongly hold on to their identity. They call themselves Merkins, M-E-R-I-K-E-N-S. And the, the, former wife of, the wife of the former prime minister is a part of this Merkin community, and I had the opportunity to talk to many of them during this project. And it's, you know... They still see themselves as those who seize their freedom from American bondage. So, yeah, there's some great stories in here. And uh, any other questions? Right here. You gave the number of uh, 52... Choctaw? 52 Choctaws. 52 yeah. Choctaws. It may be 57. Oh. I, I, I can never oh. quite remember that number. Um. Yeah, you know, Latour is is explicit about eighteen uh, for you know uh, Juzon, but do you have where did you get the the number and do you think could it be I got more? it from Latour. You got it from Latour. Well, and because I I actually edited the Latour main the reprint of the Latour volume, so I had some familiarity. I not only did I edit the Latour volume, the wonderful thing about the the uh, University of Florida edition, nineteen ninety nine. Mm -hmm. Um, we were able to take documents that Latour had collected because he had planned a second edition. So we took those documents and added them to that original volume. So there's about 30 or so additional documents that were in that edition that were not in earlier volumes. So okay. that's where I got it. Now, there was a second captain that was um, put over the, the Choctaws, uh, uh, Pierre Aylard. Uh, yep. Do you know anything? Was, there, was that because of linguistics or was that because there was more... Uh, Choctaw than, than a single captain could handle? The Choctaw, the Choctaw are present, but they don't play a major role. And what I would tell you is that generally whenever there's a second captain appointed, it's because, not because of the number, but because of the status of the individual. So. Can I ask a question? Sure. So when we talk about Jackson and the promises that he extended over um, the potential of extending freedom to the slaves that, that, that volunteered and fought, here's my question, and I might be asking you to do something that you can't do. Did he knowingly just make a promise that he realized he would never be able to deliver, or did he make a promise with the expectation that maybe we can deliver this and it just reached beyond his authority? Which was it? Did he intend to deliver on that or not? Honestly, I don't think he ever intended to deliver. I think he was making, he was grasping for whatever troops he could secure. You know, what most people don't realize is that when he arrives here in the fall of 1814, you know, he has virtually no men. I mean, he's cobbling together a force, and he's, you know, he, he, he believes there's Kentucky and Louisianans on the way. They're coming down the river, but they might not get there in time. So I've got to assemble what I can. So he's just, you know, he's like, he's like going to the garage sale and picking up everything that's under a dollar. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, guys. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, we have reached the end of our program. And before signing off for the day, I'm going to turn the microphone over to the person who was really the driving force behind the Battle of New Orleans Historical Symposium for four years now, Dr. Curtis Manning.
And thank you very much. And we had such great speakers this whole time. We ran pretty long. And so, of course, apologize we're not going to have the panel discussion. But we will, we kind of got all that in the speakers themselves. So if that works. But I just wanted to thank all of you for coming. I think it's been a great symposium for our fourth annual. And um, we've added to it like we had before. Fantastic uh, information, fantastic history. I would like to thank the Greater New Orleans Foundation Exxon Mobil Fund for sponsoring us, as well as Dr. Tommy Warner and Nunez Community College for ha having this great location. I also want, yeah, yeah. if it's all right, I want to just thank a few people that have all worked hard to make this such a su success. First off is the Battle of New Orleans Historical Symposium Advisory Committee with Christina Vela, who the symposium has been dedicated to this time for all of her work over the time. All right. As well as uh, Sam Cavill, Ron Chapman, uh, Donald Keith Midkiff, and all and Marty Morgan, your host. All of them have done a great work over the whole year. And I want to uh, thank our hospitality folks who have who did the lunch and, and made it such a, a warm environment. Michelle Miner, Kayla Miner. Oh, We'll just wait and hold the applause till the end if that works, and we'll have one big applause. How about that? So, and so, uh, so Michelle Miner, Kayla Miner, Audra Miner. If you notice a, a pattern there, you know. And so, but there, and the other Miner um, uh, is not old enough yet, but she'll be doing it too when she gets old enough. Uh, Corey Godshaw, Samuel Hippen, Jim Hippen, um, all worked well on that, as well as our technical staff, Dave Death Dessens up in the booth, Jack Jackson Jr. Bear Lemoyne, Riley Luria, and Nick Slide. So let's have a big hand for everybody. And the biggest hand to y'all, who are now officially part of the Battle of New Orleans historical community. So you'll be hearing more from me over the time. And if all goes well, uh, one of the things we've improved with the videos, we should have those available uh, very soon after. And we will, um, of course, get those links out. And then also, I think I didn't, I've seen that. I want to add Ron Chapman to the advisory committee, if I didn't mention him, as well as longtime help. And just thanks for coming. All right.